Well, hopefully everybody can hear me, but yeah, <laughs> should, should be doable. Um, first of all, everybody, yeah, just thanks also for being here. And um, for today, we're going to talk about mobile app maintenance, easy guess again. And when I was busy with this talk, I had another title, uh, which was this one. Uh, <laughs> It didn't pass marketing, and they also didn't like this one uh, from the venue. So, but basically, what I wanted to discuss is here basically the problems that you could have when you try to release a mobile application, and also the hurdles that you might have not only developing your application, but also having it in production, and also thinking about how can you get the right signals from production and fix the stuff that you have, fix the issues that you might have in production. So. What I normally try to do is to come up with kind of like an idea about to explain the complete story about those hurdles. So we first need to have an idea. And when I was thinking about this, I was like, okay, what should I talk about? I don't really have an idea about where we could correlate this to, the hurdles. And normally what I do, I'm a huge dog lover. Uh, my wife is allergic to dogs, so I don't have a dog, but I always watch movies and pictures from dogs, kind of like those funny things. So if I would have a dog, I don't know if anybody here has an animal or a dog at home, but if you would look at your dog, you could be inspired sometimes. But when you look at this picture, I was like, okay, I now think that I have an idea that I can use to explain to you the challenges that you might face when you're going to release an application to production, and also when you want to maintain that application. And the idea that I got here was let's create a new social media platform, use that application, and walk you through all those steps. And that social media platform would just be to create an application with pictures for dogs, kind of like sharing it, kind of like a new type of Instagram, but specifically for animals. So. That's the idea what we're going to use today. That's the idea that we're going to walk through during this session. But thinking about that, thinking about creating a application, you might now think, okay, I do not have the skills. We already saw that Björn was using Flutter to create an application, but then you need to learn a new language. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's harder. But yeah, everybody who's in this room, I assume that you're a master Yoda in or JavaScript, TypeScript, HTML, CSS. But then, again, what should we do? Can we build applications with the knowledge that we have? But yeah, have no fear. Tools like React Native, Native Scripts, and also Ionic are here to help you. So let's just pick one of those frameworks and use that and build that application. And again, try to look into the things that you could see or could cope with when you want to release your application to production, or when you get bugs from production. What should you think of? So what I would normally do here is grab a cup of coffee, start my laptop, and start with the things that I need to do. And first things that I would do, open my laptop, use my favorite IDE. I think for a lot of people that would be Visual Studio Code. And then look into the framework that you selected. In this case, I selected React Native. I use React Native uh, quite a lot, but you can use whatever JavaScript skill-based or TypeScript-based uh, framework out there that you want. Based on this, you would read through the documentation, and then you would see that you need to install stuff on your machine. Hopefully, you would have a Mac, so you could do something cross-platform. But when you do that, you also see that you have some system dependencies, like downloading Xcode. Uh, but when you download Xcode, you would also get, for example, iOS simulators, as you can see here. Useful to build your application, and maybe even start doing some manual testing also for it. Secondly, you need to have Android Studio. Android Studio will also come with emulators. You can basically download everything from the internet. Uh, you would have all types of versions of uh, Android that you could download. So basically, our environment is set up. We could now start with consuming our coffee and start coding. So we're going to start with this. And during kind of like the development, you might have some challenges. Challenges like that you do not know how to implement certain methods, but 
Basically, we've got our biggest friend Google here. We can just find everything on the internet and we can start implementing the suggestions. Don't copy them over from Stack Overflow immediately, but also try to learn a little bit about what is happening when you want to implement this. But after a few days, you've got your first screens ready. Our app is called Bark Insta. It's kind of like a ripoff of uh, Instagram, but basically this is the application that we want to build. This is the application that we want to release. And when you're thinking about this, um, you, you don't have a real challenge here right yet. But we also want to test it on real devices. You want to test it, for example, on the device that you have in your hands. So if you're an Android fan or an iOS uh, uh, fan, you want to test it how it responds and behaves on that device. So the first thing that you need to do, for example, for Android, is you need to set up your key. It's basically just something very simple. You don't need to pay anything, any, any money for this. Just need to create your own key, and then you're able to not only install it on your emulator, which could be done without the key, but you can also install it on your own Android device. If we would then look for iOS, then you yeah, need to pay. You need to pay something to be able to install it on an iOS device, on a physical iOS device. And there's, there's different reasons behind this. It's security, but on the other hand, it's Apple. It's also money. Everything that we do with Apple means that they need to earn some money uh, from it. So let's just dive a little bit into what, you, what options you have. Um, Basically, what we, why we need this, why we need to pay, is we need to get kind of like a certificate, and that certificate could help you install your applications, basically adding a specific identifier of your phone into the application, and then you're allowed to install that application on that phone for iOS. And then you just need to come, uh, become a member of the Apple Club, the developer club, as they call it. You need to buy a membership. You could buy the developer certificate, which will cost you 99 bucks. With those 99 bucks, you get access to just installing it on 99 phones. Uh, so if you have a lot of friends, you can already install it on the phones of your friends. And secondly, you can also push your application to the App Store. And that's basically something that we also want to do. There's also a second certificate, which is the uh, certificate for uh, the enterprise, the enterprise certificate. This is used a lot if you're working at a larger company where you want to install your iOS applications on multiple phones of your, uh, for example, your colleagues. And then the certificate itself is already added. See it also as that you can create your own internal app store. Um, easy to install it, accept the certificate, and then everybody could use that application. Um, it will cost you 299 bucks, but sometimes it's, uh, it's worth paying for this. But if you've done this, then you need to build your application. Hopefully you already have a Mac M1, because if you don't have it, you can boil an egg on the other Macs, because especially for iOS, if you're using Xcode, it will consume a lot of CPU, fan will blow like, uh, like crazy. So hopefully this is something that you could already start using. But when you look at this, and when you look at the build process, then Android is pretty fast. But if you would then look at, for example, iOS, then you would see that it's pretty slow. And if you would already think about the future, you're like, okay, do I need to wait every time seven or 15 minutes, depending on the machine that you have, depending on the build pipeline you have? Well, something that we will figure out later, but this is something to keep in the back of our mind. And when we think about this, we need a break. And normally what I do when I need a break is I just walk the dog, and think about the things that I could do. And one of the things that I need to do now is think about, okay, can we also test our application? How are we going to do that? And if you would look into whatever framework you selected, um, it feels like you're drinking from the fire hose. You get a lot of information about testing. It's not only UI testing, but we first start, for example, with unit testing. You can already cover a lot of things with unit tests. But then, if you look at the application that you're creating, Park Insta, um, we also want to do some UI test cases. And if you would look at that, then you've got multiple solutions. If you're using React Native, you can use something which is called Detox. But if you want to have something which is cross-platform, you can also use on multiple devices, different devices, and also real devices, then maybe something like Appium might be useful for you. 
But if you're then busy creating your test cases, you also see that executing those test cases and comparing that with the knowledge that you have and the experience that you have with web applications, you would see that this is also pretty slow. So you decide now to create less test cases, only one or two that are the most important things, because in the end, if you want to release your application, you just want to have your fast feedback. So we've tested our application on our private phone. We were able now to also walk through it on emulators and simulators, do some manual testing. Our application is ready. So we're pretty happy. We want to release it to the stores. But yeah, this dog is not called Karma for, uh, for no reason. Because when we want to release it to the stores, Karma will hit us. And the things that will happen here are, for example, we need to pay again. And this is not for Apple. We already paid Apple enough money. This is for Android. If we want to release to the App Store or to the Google Play Store, we already need to pay 25 bucks. But when you're trying to push your application to the App Stores, you're like, what? A review? Do I, do I get a review on my application? Normally, when I was releasing my web application and the experience that I have with a web application, it's basically I just push it to production. <laughs> it's there in a few minutes. I need to wait one to seven days here before I get a response from Apple or from Google. It can be faster than the seven days, but yeah, if you're one of the lucky bastards, you will get an extensive review from Android and they will look into your application. But yeah, okay, this is one of the things we just need to accept. So let's just push our applications and see and wait for the review. So after three days, we get a response in our email box and we're like, ah, oh, shit, it got rejected. Because yeah, people need to log into our application and we figured out that we did not provide the credentials for Google and Apple to also test it with the login data. But yeah, okay. What is, let's just fix that, let's just provide all the information to the stores and just make sure that they can test it. And after one day, we get a new response, we get a new email, and yes, it is accepted. This is the point where we can now start earning money, but also start thinking about all the pictures that you would get. I would already kind of like wet my pants for all the things that you could see, all the funny things. We need to be aware of the GDPR. You cannot always see what's in production. On the other hand, if you need to fix some bugs, you might see some nice pictures. But this is really, really cool. My app is out there. But is it really out there? Is your app already out there when you got the approval? No, it's not out there. It's not with, with uh, your web application that's already installed that people can just use your application, no, we still need to wait for the stores to update all the data servers. And this can take up between one and 24 hours. So again, something we need to be aware of, especially when we develop this application, also when you're busy for your end customer, that this is one of the phases that we also need to think of, time. But in the end, our application is out there, I'm happy, I'm enjoying what I'm seeing. But I get an email, and I'm really excited. It's my first review. I'm like, okay, review is out there. And I get one out of five stars with my application. I'm like, what? What's happening here? So if I would read the review, it's like someone tried to install my application, someone tried to log in, and there were issues. Some people can use it, but this user is not able to use it. The app crashes after login. Reinstalling doesn't help. Do I have enough information now? What can I do now? How can I fix this? Because it's my pride, it's my baby. I want to have everybody using my application. I want everybody to be happy. So you become a little bit depressed here. Like, okay, I try to do everything here, try to do my best. And if I just compare this with the normal path that I need to walk for web applications, I don't have those many issues not as many, and waiting times as we have with mobile applications. So why this story? Why kind of like trying to walk you through this story? I think, like I already mentioned, if you just look at what your experience are, assuming that you're already doing a lot with web applications, and you want to start with mobile app development, then these are the hurdles that you can get. These are the hurdles that you can face, that your application is not accepted, that your application is not 
out there in production within a few hours or even within a few minutes. And what I just wanted to do, if you just look at all those steps, then those are steps from the software development life cycle. Where we're talking about planning, building, uh, testing, deploying it to production. So what I wanted to do also is to walk through those steps and basically just compare that with the app. Where are the real hurdles and where, what are the things that we need to be aware of when we want to release that application to production? And everybody knows this one, where we have the planning, building, testing, deploying. I added this one also for uh, the extra uh, arrow there for releasing to the stores. It's kind of like that delay that we already discussed. But let's just walk through this and just compare what you were uh, used to with a web application and compare, and compare that with kind of like the equal uh, complexity of a hybrid or a native application. And if you would then start with planning uh, uh, and encoding, well, basically this is pretty easy. There's, there's hardly any difference between uh, hybrid and uh, uh, native apps in comparison to the web application. If you would then think about building, a building might take some time for web applications, depending if you're using Webpack or whatever bundler you want to use, uh, and also how uh, big your application is. It can take up to five, six minutes maybe, but if you would compare this for native applications or hybrid applications, this can take up between five and 15 minutes, 15, one, five, sorry, uh, minutes. So this could already be a delay in your build pipeline. But okay, it's, it might not be too big. Let's go to the next step. The next step, sorry, it's medium slow. Let's go to the next step, testing. In this case, I wanted to look not only to unit test cases, because unit test cases for web applications in comparison to uh, unit test cases for mobile applications, there's no real big uh, difference there. It's equally, if we look at the time. But if we look at UI test cases, then for the web application, there are all kinds of solutions to do that, to look into how to speed up your front end and maybe use some mocking, set some states. It's a little bit harder to do that also with mobile applications and especially with native applications. So if you would compare that with each other, we need to be aware of the fact that this will be two to six times slower for the same amount of test cases and the same amount of complexity. And this is basically where we were in the phase when we were developing our application. We selected that framework. So this is the part that we already covered. Then the deploying, I think this is something that a lot of companies would love to reach, being able to do it daily, hourly, or even per minute, but when you have your pipeline, when there's not too much complexity, you are able to do that with web applications. And like I already mentioned, if you would compare this for the stores, then you would have the review time. The review time from one to seven days. This is something that could already block you in releasing a fix, especially a fix which would be a blocker, or basically the bug that was a blocker for your end users. And then last but not least, we also have operate feedback, basically how easy is it for us to debug something what's happening on, uh, in our application. And if we would do that for web, then you would see that you would have five browsers, pretty easy to debug that. You can install it on your own machine, or you can use cloud services to get different OS versions and also different browser versions. So debugging here is pretty easy. But if you don't have the right tools, and you don't have the right information, you would have some challenges here, especially for mobile or hybrid applications. And the challenges that you might have are, for example, the fact that the devices cannot be reverted. The applications cannot be removed from the phone from your user. You do not have access to it. You can easily roll back a fix when you're talking about web application or roll back a bug that you introduced and just, or patch it with a fix or just roll it back. This is not something that you could do easily from the phones from your user. There are ways that you need to be a little bit more clever about this, that you have kind of like a versioning management system and that you can just show alerts and basically block the screen of your user if you really have a blocking bug in your application, but there's no way to remove that. So you really need to think about how can we kind of like interact with our customer, especially when we have a an, an, an really important fix for our application. Secondly, what we also need to be aware of is that mobile is remote by default. That means that you never know what your customer is doing. You hardly know what, what type of phone they have, what OS version, the amount of apps that they have on their phone, storage, memory, CPU. It's pretty hard to determine this. And last but not least, what's also pretty hard here, and this is also for the UI testing part, you would have a fragmented market. 
If you would look at the amount of active models that you would have for iOS, I think you would have now around 28 models, active iPhones and also active iPads. You could reduce that to around 8 to 10 models if you would only focus also on screen size. But that's pretty, pretty easy between quotes to handle that. But if you would look at Android, then you would have, for example, UOI, you would have Sonomi, you would have Samsung, they've got their own skins. But it's not only the brands, you would have those models, and then those models also have different versions of Android. So it's pretty hard also to test everything here for your customer to fix all those bugs. And in the end, what we already saw, that testing took a long time, so we already decided not to run too many UI test cases. So especially if you have such a large market, it might not be the best choice. But let's get back also to that software development lifecycle. Um, that feedback loop, especially for testing, for deploying, and getting the information also from production, is the most important part here. I know we all want to code. We want to create a uh, feature, we want to fix a bug and just push it to production. But if you do not take into account that these phases could slow you down, and especially when we're talking about the deploying phase, that part, you would still have the review process, even for new versions that you're going to release to production. So it will slow you down. You cannot release your application to production as fast as you could do with web applications. So we really need to think about what's happening. And if you would also look at the market, then you would also see that the market itself is changing. Just imagine uh, that you're now working for a large company, that you are building that application for a large company. What are the expectations that your end user have, what your end users have from your application? Well, basically, they want to have a real good quality. That also means that your release velocity and also uh, uh, um, your, your frequency needs to be increased. That's what they expect. If you find a bug, you need to fix it as soon as possible. And this is, again, pretty easy for the web, but if we still look at a deployment phase, it could be pretty hard or time-consuming when we look at mobile applications. We also have a challenge here with shifting signals from left uh, to left and shifting to right, where we can get extra signals uh, from, for example, our initial phase where we're doing, doing the coding, where we're doing the U, uh, UI testing or unit testing, uh, testing some APIs, but also what's happening in production. And there are new tools out there that could help you get that information to build up the information you need to have to fix something earlier in your pipeline to prevent going to production with certain issues. And then last but not least, the market also wants more confidence in production. And that's something that comes from your own customer, the own company that you're working for. So if you would look at this, then you would see that we need to have more insights. If we look at those three points, we need to have more insights. And the first insight basically is the intent. We can start testing a lot, but if we're not able to use that information properly, you would also have a challenge there. And last but not least, we also have the behavior. The behavior is what is happening in production. How are my end users using my application? So if you look at this and you would go back to the software development lifecycle, then one thing that you could add here to prevent going to production with or a bug or with a flow that basically does not align with what your customer is expecting is by using beta testing. I don't know if anybody ever heard about beta testing or also using beta testing, but basically when we're talking about beta testing, we're basically providing the application to real world users, so not our QA people that might test the application or yourself, but people out there in the field walking through your application. And they could have different focuses, like a technical focus or a marketing focus, like is the flow and the design what you expect from it. But information from that beta testing program could be really useful to determine, as you can see here, what needs fixing or what needs ditching. And if you want to compare this, I usually use this meme. I think this is something that a lot of people have seen that goes on Twitter, on uh, whatever social media platform you want, uh, you're already using. It's where we have design and we have our user experience. And here you could say that all the testing that we're already doing, I call that alpha testing, 
is something, it's just following the pavement. Because we want to build a feature, so we're going to test the feature as we think that we need to test it. We think that our users would use our application. But yeah, if I just look at my dad, he's a little bit older than I am. Uh, his fingers are completely different than mine. Uh, he always does the fat finger test. I don't know if you've ever heard of that one. Um, it's also part of that beta testing. He's pressing on buttons. He's sliding or swiping through his application in a different way than I would do that. And that information is really useful because he is not going to walk on that pavement. He's going to take a shortcut. He doesn't even know that he's taking a shortcut, but he's taking a shortcut. He's going to use our application in a different way. So getting that information would be really useful if you start a beta testing program. And beta testing is not specifically something that you would do in the testing phase that you go when you go to uh, before you go to the stores. You can also start that program when you're already in production, because with beta testing, you also have the option to provide or to ask for feedback. That if a user is using his phone and he has an issue, he can basically just shake with his phone, and then he get a form. He can get, he can create a screenshot. He can create a video. He can create a sketch on that screenshot, and provide you with the information. And using that signal from or production or in a beta phase before you go to production could be really useful and prevent you for, to go into production with or a bug or with a flow which is basically just not logical because the only thing that we did when we built it, we just built the pavement, the things that we think that we need to build based on documentation, uh, feature requests that we get from our product owners. And then last but not least, what we also need to think about is the debugging part. Debugging itself is really important. How can we get the right information from our application when it's installed, for example, in production? How do we get, if there's an error, if there's a crash, how do we get that information? How do we know how to fix it? And when we're talking about this, it's not only specifically production. I've basically placed it here also in your testing phase. Because during your testing phase, if you do manual testing, if you do beta testing, or if you do automated testing, you could still have crashes. You could still have errors in your application. The errors might not break your flow, but it might create a memory leak. And that is also something that you want to prevent. So implementing something like debugging, or at least the tools to debug your application during the first phase, like the testing, would be really helpful and easy for you to create that fix that you need to do. And just to give you a, a simple example of a report, what you could get, uh, this is just a screenshot for a native application, but this is a crash report from an application. And if you would just zoom in, then you can get already the things that you need to help basically to the line of, the, uh, of code in your application to see what's happening. You can get the device model, and if we would scroll more down in the report, we would also see uh, uh, the version of the application. We would see also more information about the, app, uh, about the phone itself, which OS version, IP address, basically everything that the customer would be doing on his phone could be recorded and could be added in that debugging report. So if you would now just look back, I've, I've talked about a lot of things, and if we go back to the initial slide that we had, it's like mobile app maintenance easy, I guess again. Yeah, if you don't have the right experience, if you basically try to rely on what you've done in the past, on your experience of web applications, then yeah, mobile applications and maintaining them in production can be really, really hard. But if you implement the right signals, if you implement, for example, a better testing program, because I don't expect you to run more and more test cases. Sometimes it's better to really understand what your user is doing, how your user is using your application, and if it crashes, get the right information from production, being able to find the right line of code where it crashes or which is causing the memory leak, that could really help you fix your issue even before you go to production. So if you want to know more also about this, then this is basically what we as SaaS Labs can help you with. All kinds of toolings to give you the insight also for your mobile applications. I'm not going to do a sales pitch here. That's not why you're here. If you want to know more about this part, then please just go to the booth there. 
colleagues and I can help you if you have any questions about mobile app development slash also the tools that you could use to get the right signals from production. And then last slide, I didn't introduce myself. I thought, well, you're not coming here for me. So I just started my talk, but I'm Wim, work at SaaS Labs. And yeah, basically if you have any questions now, then feel free to ask them. Otherwise, uh, I'm out there at the booth or just grab a cup of coffee. So thank you all for your attention. Any questions? Uh, what's the difference between SOS Labs and, for example, Firebase Tech Lab or AWS Device Lab? Is there a big difference? I think if you would look, for example, at Firebase and AWS Device Farm, then you need to create basically everything yourself. You need to provide everything yourself, and the reports and the insights you would get there uh, are minimal. If you would look at a solution at SAS Labs, that we would have basically all the solutions in one place. It's not only that you would get your browsers, your desktop browsers, uh, or you would get the physical devices, but you would also get the insights in how your complete application is behaving through that development lifecycle. So we can give you more information in comparison to, for example, tools like AWS or uh, Firebase. Everything basically. No. So that's why I'm curious because IBM versus Soap Labs, because I don't work with Soap Labs, but ABN, so I'm Oh, you're not working with, uh, with uh, Sauce at ABN? No, no, we, <laughs> we, we use this just for testing. Yeah. So we have different tools that No. Yeah, in the end, you would have basically the same infrastructure. Yeah. Um, also options that you would have with, uh, with SaaS Labs, and then we would dive more into specific features, is that uh, mocking your camera or being able to mock biometrics if you want to use that flow also in your application. You might be stuck when you're in AWS or in Firebase because you would only get that infrastructure, uh, uh, basically the devices. We are able also to uh, instrument your application, uh, look into uh, network traffic, provide you with information about that, give you the opportunity to use a camera. Uh, for example, if you need to scan a accept uh, or if you need to scan a, a passport, we can provide a way to use the camera even though the device is in uh, the data center. Normally, you just want to create that picture it's not possible, but we can help you also with solutions for that. So it's also some extra features that we can provide. But yeah, also love to discuss it more in detail also for uh, uh, the ABN case. Uh. Yeah. Uh, we, we use it for that just that it's a time on the web. Yeah. And sometimes you need to make some connection to mobile to have to Any other questions? For, <coughs> for on, on web, you can use something to um, like hot jar to collect the ABO stats in production and then use those um, those recordings, Selenium recordings no. to go and create tests or uh, just look at the ABO. Is there something equivalent for mobile um, to the hot jar that you can use to collect the ABO? Basically, just kind of like getting an overview of all the API calls that your mobile application is doing. Uh, yeah, like what, what interactions are the users doing? Um, are you then specifically looking into the, the user interactions, like the touching your screen itself? No. Um, if you would look at SaaS Labs, uh, uh, we just implemented a feature for mobile applications that we can also provide you the touch points uh, on that mobile application uh, from during that testing. Could be manual testing or could also be automated testing. That is something in the report. If you want to get more information from production, for example, or in that beta testing phase. And with the beta program that we have, we can also provide videos uh, with the touch points of your customers. It will be kind of like a minute video uh, of the situation that your customer is providing uh, to you. And there you would have also more details like CPU usage, memory usage, basically everything that was happening on the phone of that end user could be in a pre-phase or could even be in production. 
And you could even use that better program to do even uh, remote controlling uh, or remote, uh, um, how do you call it? It's not specifically controlling, but you could interact with your customer on production uh, uh, when he or she is using that device. So you could also see what's happening on that device when he or she is walking through the app or has an issue with it. Yep. Cool. Then thanks everybody for your attention. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we still, still have some time. We've got, what is it, 10 minutes? Or five? Oh, we've got five minutes. Uh, I thought 10, but. If I understand you correctly, you're asking if we have more information about uh, uh, the different tech stacks, uh, hybrid applications, uh, how... The like, for example, no. How, how they compare, no. How they compare with other uh, tech stacks, uh, uh, for example, or other applications. Um, internally, we have that information. It's only information that cannot be shared with, uh, uh, basically, to the outer world. Um, but yeah, there is information that we have internally. Um, yeah, not something that is shareable. Okay. Any other questions? Well, then uh, thanks and grab a cup of coffee and uh, see you in other rooms. <laughs> okay, thanks.